the Communications Manager at Rescue EU, the European Federation of Citizen Energy Cooperatives. And I'm very pleased to see so many people joining us this uh, Friday morning to discuss uh, the topic of community-based flexibility. So a warm welcome uh, from myself and, and all the speakers and collaborators. Um, just as a small note, this webinar is a collaboration between uh, the Rescue PVP project, uh, which is a UN fund, EU funded project that is developing energy flexibility tools by cooperatives mm -hmm. for cooperatives. Uh, but you will learn more about uh, the Rescue PVP project later. And uh, Grid Singularity, which is an open source energy technology, technology startup. Um, and also, you will uh, get to know them better um, in this webinar. So uh, I would like to commend uh, Grid Singularity for their contributions and efforts uh, also in promoting this webinar because we see a lot of people um, finding their way to this webinar today. Um, for your information, this webinar is the third webinar in a series of webinars we organize um, at Rescue PU around this topic of community-based flexibility. And um, yeah, we feel that it's becoming more and more a hot topic. And we hope that today we will be able to share some valuable insights and be able to present you some tools that actually can enable the participation of citizens in a locally managed and interactive renewable energy grid. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, a packed and interesting agenda for you. Uh, we first have four presentations of 15 minutes. Um, after each presentation, there will be uh, two minutes for a clarifying question, to ask a clarifying question, but really short sure because at the end of this uh, webinar, we have um, a Q&A where you can uh, yeah, ask all the questions you still have. Um, so don't hesitate if you have questions to put them in our Q&A section. You can find it at the bottom um, of, of the screen. Um, maybe another practical uh, thing, it would be great if you can put your organization um, next to your name. So we know a bit who is in this webinar. Um, and for your information, it's also being recorded, um, this webinar. So, um, yeah, let's, let's start. We have a full agenda, so um, welcome, enjoy, and then I would like to give the word to my colleague, uh, Roland Toulon. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Sarah. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm here today to introduce the, the new landscape of energy services in which uh, the two initiatives that uh, will be presented today are, are taking place. Um, so this is the context of the energy transition. On the production side yesterday, we've uh, had a lot of um, large power plants based on coal, gas, oil, or nuclear uh, fuel technology. This is now changing with a lot more renewables um, in the system uh, and based on uh, wind or solar as the lion's share of renewable energies, which are spread energies, right? And with a lot of small producers. So on the market uh, side, this means we are shifting from a centralized market to a lot more decentralized ones uh, with a lot more market actors. And also some challenges at the infrastructure level. Uh, there will be need for a lot more, um, yeah, for more infrastructure or more flows uh, on the system. And at the distribution side, this also means bi-directional flows. Uh, a system which was built to just be top-down from the big producers to consumers is now seeing a lot more uh, generation. Uh, most PV and uh, and solar, I mean. Onshore, um, onshore wind, sorry, are taking place at the distribution level, which means for distributors, uh, distribution system operators, new challenges in uh, regulating these uh, bi-directional flows. And finally, at the end of this chain, uh, you'll have not passive uh, passive consumers, but active consumers. So this chain is not a chain anymore, but a loop. And um, next slide. So the role of consumers um, is quite important uh, in this uh, energy transition because um, they can play very, uh, well, they'll have to play uh, for a successful energy transition uh, 
a crucial role. First, uh, through their ability to, to adapt to the availability of renewable energy. Renewable energy, they are, well, when sun is shining or wind is blowing, there is uh, uh, energy, but otherwise you'll need to, to stock it, which for now is quite uh, expensive. So the ability to shift, uh, to adapt to, uh, to the status of uh, renewable energy is quite important. This can be uh, through the whole energy system and so through the role of the retailer or directly for prosumers to adapt to the energy that is being produced on your own roof. So this is a key part, but there are also a key role that uh, consumers can play to support the energy system and system operators, which is uh, to support the quality of electricity. So really the real time adapt adaptations needed to, uh, yeah, to provide security of supply. And this can be through participation to uh, TSO frequency reserves, for example. So that's number two in this uh, illustration. Uh, but also uh, to help managing um, uh, congestion, especially at distribution system, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Next slide. So this is the new landscape in which we are evolving right now from a epicenter that was really much based on the production side, a lot of interaction there to manage the different time frames. Uh, and, uh, and different technologies to a system that is getting more complex with a lot more interaction at the distributed level, which includes uh, production, distribution, and active uh, consumers. Next slide. So this gives or leaves room for a lot more new, uh, for many new service providers and this is the the overview being presented here of these new uh, energy service providers in the context where energy is not a commodity anymore but more and more uh, a service uh, so when looking at um, this challenge of consuming more of your own uh, produced energy as prosumers, you'll have energy service companies that are supporting uh, supporting consumers to optimize their own uh, own installation. So these are the the ESCO, and this may happen at the individual level. So for a single house, for example, but also at the collective uh, collective level for a whole building. Um, through collective self-consumption or uh, why not for a neighborhood through uh, what is called energy sharing. Um, then you'll also have aggregators uh, who bundle many of these uh, distributed resources to provide them uh, in particular to system providers, to system operators, sorry. So as I said, either for congestion management, um, mainly for DSOs, but also for frequency uh, or voltage uh, services. And finally, you still have uh, retailers, uh, also in their quality of BRP, but uh, will have to, to smarten their, their offer uh, in order to play this uh, active role of uh, balancing consumption and, um, and production real time in a lot more uh, dynamic production environment with a lot more renewables in the system and uh, enabling consumers to, to react to this uh, availability or scarcity of renewables. So this is the new environment also of uh, service providers. Uh, next slide. Well, now a few words about the two uh, initiatives that we are presenting today and the context in which they are uh, operating. As I said, there are now uh, many local service providers in their quality of aggregator, energy service company, or retailer. And these new services uh, are mostly based on real-time data, based on digital platform, and they require quite some new uh, digital capability in order to, to support these activities. Um, in order to support them in this effort, they may require the need of service provider. So this will be the role for a whole new set of digital service providers that may provide them with the tools in order to make this 
uh, digital step onwards. And this is the role that Risk of VPP intends to play for uh, energy communities and energy cooperatives in particular, enabling them to smarten their, their business in order to provide these new offers that will enable to manage a fully renewable uh, energy system. Right? Um, next slide. Then complementary to this, uh, but now downstream, we were upstream uh, in the first uh, aspect. Now downstream to that, these new actors, and are in particular the new the aggregators, will require in order to optimize really the, the system, uh, which is for now very fragmented. We'll see there are new actors, new needs that are uh, appearing. Uh, in order to optimize these services, they may need uh, local hubs, local marketplaces that would enable them to um, provide the flexibility they've gathered uh, to the places where they make more sense for the system, a place that gathers all the, the system uh, actors uh, to, to procure their flexibility. And this is the role of local flexibility market or local energy market. And this is a role that uh, Grid Singularity uh, intends to, to play. So you can really see that in this webinar, we will cover both aspects uh, around uh, aggregators and new uh, market players, both upstream, how do we support them, but also downstream, how do we help them uh, to go uh, on the market and support actively uh, the energy system beyond only uh, prosumers. Okay, uh, next slide. Here is a little bit more uh, in details, the role of uh, local energy market. So again, you can see on the left, the procurers of, uh, of these local energy resources. And again, they can be TSO, DSO system operators for uh, frequency or congestion management or voltage. Still also the electricity suppliers to balance their own portfolio at different uh, time frame. And uh, on the provider's uh, side, you can see the large energy users, which are actually already uh, active in the energy system, aggregators. Uh, some of them are already active in the energy system, helping uh, mid-size um, energy players to, uh, to sell their resources to TSOs, for example, and mainly, of course. Um, but these local energy market suppliers will also enable a lot more smaller and decentralized actors to, uh, to optimize the system at a more local level also. So enabling um, storage, generation and uh, consumption units to, uh, to support the energy system. And aggregators, also more local aggregators that would gather um, domestic flexibility or community uh, flexibility. And this is also uh, this last role of enabling community flexibility that we see for uh, cooperatives in the future. Well, I hope this is a complete overview. Uh, one last slide just to introduce um, the reports on which most or all of these uh, illustrations were taken from. If, um, if you feel you lack the, the, the basics of the discussion, or you'd like to hear more from what I just said, or even better, if you want to, um, to include, to invite other people uh, in this discussion, uh, this report is designed as a good uh, starter to get introduced to these new energy challenges. Uh, if there are a few questions, I'm happy to answer to a few clarifications right now. Yeah, um, thanks a lot, uh, Roland, for, for your presentation. Um, there are indeed uh, a few questions in the Q&A. Um, I would say uh, the question from Andrea is maybe something you can uh, take now. Uh, are these flexibility markets only local or could they cover larger areas? Um, that's maybe interesting. Um, that will be interesting and uh, I think we'll hear more from uh, Grid Singularity uh, in a little while. Uh, but well, conceptually, there are already few initiatives also in different, uh, different uh, places. It depends who are the actors uh, involved. 
if you're talking about uh, the consumer side, they may be more localized. Uh, if you're talking about the infrastructure, if DSOs are there, it may concern only their area. Uh, if the TSO are there, they are national entities. So frequency can be, uh, yeah, can be solved from anywhere in the energy system. And so this could be at a national scale. So it's really a matter of, uh, of design for these uh, marketplaces. But the, uh, the basics of, uh, of this service is really to optimize the different flow of energy. And I think the basic actors are the consumer and the distribution system operators. So this should somehow cover uh, a physical uh, area. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Roland, for, for your answer. Um, I see there's more people asking uh, questions in the Q&A and also in the chat. So um, thanks a lot for that. Uh, I propose we now uh, move on to the next speaker. Uh, we have our Q&A um, session at the end of this webinar. Um, and in the meantime, our panelists will try to also uh, live chat a bit with you to answer uh, your questions. So um, Vincent Didix from Energy ID, if you can take uh, the word and uh, yeah, share your presentation with us. Thanks. Yes, I will, thank you. Uh, Sarah, uh, nice to see so many people uh, joining in uh, today. My name is uh, Vincent Tirix from Energy ID. We're in a Belgian uh, IT cooperative, uh, building IT tools to speed up the energy transition. Um, today, I want to present you in more detail our Rescope VPP project. Uh, what is, a, of course, a project not only with, uh, with us as a small company, but together with a lot of uh, partners with a great ambition, uh, I must say. So we want to uh, create the most advanced community-driven smart building ecosystem, uh, specifically for energy communities. Um, of course, I will show you more uh, in the next slide how we see this. Um, I think a good basis and a good starting point for everyone is to understand that we are all uh, a family uh, within the Resco PU family of small uh, to let's say medium small um, energy cooperatives um, you, everybody knows that a lot of international players are building uh, a lot of high uh, level IT tools we all know um, but we think there is still a way uh, from small communities uh, collectively working on, um, on tools that can really help us um, bringing more autonomy um, self-sufficiency as communities and also bridging as communities, the end user to the energy market. And the energy market, of course, is, is complex. A lot of people don't know with all these high technologies and all these uh, difficult um, uh, technologies, they see how to become part of this energy transition. And so uh, we see this uh, a really important role there for energy communities to help to support their members in this um, energy field. And so you see here, that the Rescope VPP project is actually 12 uh, partners uh, joining, a lot of them uh, bigger uh, energy cooperatives within the Rescope EU family, but also um, some uh, academic partners, the University of Ljubljana, we have EE Lab from the University of Ghent, uh, we have SNAP as coordinator from Portugal, and uh, the other uh, partners, um, I will uh, present them more in detail when we talk about the pilots. Um, this ambition, in 2016 already, we were talking with a lot of uh, different cooperatives uh, from the family, uh, talking, let's see how we could uh, work together, because we saw that a lot of them were taking initiatives on building uh, stuff, all kinds of tools, there, there was the tools that were helpful uh, for themselves. And uh, in 2016, we uh, planned the first meeting at the beginning of 2017 to, to see what are we all doing, uh, how, what are we all building. And then um, I think the next year, 2018, um, together with Roland, we started uh, a uh, demand response working group, starting in more detail, talking about community uh, technology, smart community technology. And so then uh, within this demand response working group, we start talking about a project. We had a nice opportunity and here we are, um, the Rescope VPP project, um, virtual power plant, of course, for VPP, um, started 
almost one year ago in June 2020 with these 12 uh, partners and uh, with five pilot sites. So here, the rescovpp.au website, you can find us, um, you can find news about the project where you can find, of course, also contact details if you want to uh, follow up on us. So today I want to uh, show in um, quickly, of course, we don't have a lot of time, um, the basic ideas of our project. And so it started from the proposal um, and of course the question from Europe uh, for the proposals. Um, the goal was starting with legacy equipment. We have of course a built environment with a lot of houses with already a lot of equipment inside. Uh, with new build, we can start all over with uh, fresh uh, technologies, but of course that's not the reality. Uh, we have maybe 1% of new houses, maybe up to 3% if we're lucky of new houses here. So that means we have to find a way to make existing buildings more smart. And that means we start from a primary control level, legacy equipment, trying to connect them, getting them connected and try to get them working as a smart home. And therefore we need a secondary control level. And this is what we call the coffee box, the community flexibility box. Um, we start from a smart home controller acting also as an edge computer. Uh, we can have some local computing power, uh, but also as a gateway to the smart community in the cloud. Um, I will go in more detail later, but this is what we call the secondary control level. And then we have a tertiary control level. This is actually the community tools where the community um, can aggregate their members and bring them to the energy market. So you could see the community tools also as the bridge to the bigger uh, energy market. And this is where the more cloud computing side um, is going on. So this coffee, this uh, coffee ecosystem, the community flexibility ecosystem consists of the coffee box uh, connected to its own cloud and the community cloud. You could see an interaction where setting, uh, settings, set points from the cloud is going to the coffee box information like dynamic tariffs, uh, grids uh, um, information will go to the coffee box. Uh, actually, it's a coffee box uh, from a privacy perspective that um, subscribes to the coffee information. Uh, and also to make sure that uh, the members get their data, um, can share the data with others. We have also got data going uh, to the coffee cloud. The coffee box itself with the legacy the equipment, that's the data going through the home network, uh, the connection uh, going on in the local area network, and uh, we have legacy devices with controllers, sensors, uh, all kinds of data from smart meters, for instance, that are uh, connected with the coffee box. Um, connecting legacy equipment, of course, is not an easy ta task. Eh? We know that there is a lot of uh, existing equipment with old um, uh, digital uh, uh, architectures. Um, what are we talking about? Yeah, even uh, not smart appliances at all, like uh, immersion heaters, uh, all kinds of boilers, um, maybe uh, white, white goods like uh, uh, dishwashers, washing machines, um, uh, cool fridges, um, and we have PV panels, maybe already with some older uh, inverters. Um, other kind of equipment we're talking about is more recently the heat pumps. Of course, older air conditioners are also heat pumps, but we are talking more about mod more modern way of heat pumps, um, hybrid heat pumps, maybe uh, ground-based heat pumps. Uh, we're talking about electrical uh, storage systems that are going uh, stronger and stronger in the market. And we're talking about EVs where you see now uh, recently really uh, taking off uh, in the market. So this is what when, when we're talking about uh, the legacy equipment. But of course, the challenge how to measure and to control uh, these legacy devices. And you could see, of course, uh, a big ambition would be that we start developing all kinds of connections to uh, for every kind of uh, manufacturer and every kind of uh, device uh, history. Um, that's where we uh, thought, how could we uh, build further on uh, already open source and collaborative tools uh, in the market? And this is uh, why we've um, decided to, to build further on a really uh, nice and uh, important and well-known uh, open source uh, project. 
uh, with more than six to seven thousand people already worked on it around the world. And this is an, um, uh, a smart, um, sorry, a home automation system, open source home automation system uh, called Home Assistant. And um, this community, this really live community, has already more than uh, 1,700 uh, integrations with all kinds of manufacturers. And for us, this is really a starting point to make sure that with our home controller, we can uh, connect with uh, devices around the house. So we are leverage, leveraging uh, this work. Um, and of course, we will uh, contribute our own developments in turn. Then this box, of course, needs more, um, uh, more opportunities um, because we need to control. Um, that means we are focusing on uh, connecting, uh, connecting, connecting uh, the devices to the coffee cloud, um, making new kinds of blocks of software, um, not only the automation from the home assistant technology, but also the metering uh, devices we're integrating and where we need some data logging. And also, of course, all the edge computing going on, uh, like explicit, implicit demand responses that should get um, scheduled. Uh, some, uh, sometimes a forecasting algorithm like PV forecasting can run on the device itself. And uh, the blocks um, and the way we are uh, the, uh, uh, building these um, new kinds of software is uh, typically in Docker and uh, Python uh, codes we are working and uh, of course open source uh, as we are talking uh, really community driven that means we are opening it up for the community to develop with us together the coffee cloud itself is also where individual the community can um, have a place for individual data storage also where individual members can decide gdpr of course based uh, where how they can share their data but also where the community management is taking place, because we are talking about a community um, yeah, selling or, or renting or uh, bringing these devices to the houses. And uh, that means that the community has to have an eye on the, on the devices in the field, as there has to be some device management. They have to have some customer relation um, management, so connection with their own systems to make sure they know uh, their uh, members and they can provide some support in the field but also the coffee cloud is where the smart community is um, is happening and that means we need data integration uh, data aggregation if we want to connect to flexibility services from aggregators we need to get them connected uh, as a community uh, and there is also of course some um, aggregated uh, data um, crunching going on uh, or needed because we need as a community also to optimize ourselves uh, we start the coffee box let's say is an individual optimization um, and, and there's where you start self uh, consumption optimization but Malta will talk more about the services but of course as a community you need to uh, optimize and of course as a community um, in the future, you will also uh, have to be, let's say, a flexible community, smart community. You have to respond to um, the market dynamic tariffs, what's happening in the market, imbalances. And that means there, uh, as a community, you need to, to be able to start some response actions, whether it's explicit or implicit uh, demand response. So this is what we are working on as a community in the cloud. And I want to focus the last uh, topic focus more in detail on uh, specific developments that, that are also handy, not only for this uh, smart community, but also for the retailers or the supply side of things. And this is where our French partner Enercoop is really working hard on forecasting tools, uh, production forecasting, but also demand forecasting for a whole portfolio. And um, this is where uh, data from the calendar, from the supplier portfolio, weather data is crunched in, in some algorithms to make sure that ahead we have already a good forecast on the total loads uh, and the total production of our communities. So this is really, in short, uh, what we are building uh, as an introduction. We're in our project also are testing it live environments. Uh, you see here uh, the six pilots uh, around Europe where we are working or the six organizations that are helping us out with live pilots um, with Carmicope in the UK, Ecopower Energent in uh, Belgium 
Burgeren werken in Germany, Enercoop, France, and some here in Spain. I said we are community driven. That means we are uh, looking for people to join our uh, efforts. Um, here's some more information uh, where you can have the documentation uh, on dot, uh, coffeebox.io, our GitLab group, where you can find the risk of VPB. Uh, repositories and also the NFCO forecasting, uh, which is GitHub um, repository. So this was our uh, short introduction to the project. Um, thank you for listening. And I don't know if uh, Sarah, there are some. Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot, uh, Vincent, for for this introduction to the project. Um, I see there are many uh, interesting questions already in the Q and A section. Uh, I will take one uh, clarifying question, maybe now for you, um, Vincent. Uh, Christian asked whether the data that the coffee box is handling, is it similar, is it the same data that uh, smart meters have, um, that the distributor is using to make uh, the energy bill? Is that the same yeah. data that you're using? Um, of course, smart metering data is an important uh, part of the data. And I give you a, a, the Flemish ex example. We have smart meters that have, of course, um, a link to the DSO backend. So there is a uh, day uh, after data going, so every night data uploaded to the DSO for metering purposes for the official uh, supplier site and market site. But on the same hand, the, these uh, smart meters typically have a local interface where you can have, for instance, in Flanders, seconds data. Um, so for community sites and supplier sites, we try to use existing data as much as possible. So if we have a connection to the energy market, you could use the data maybe day after coming from uh, the official metering site. But for really uh, fast responses and intraday responses, the official data chain is just too short. And this is where the uh, coffee box tries to connect. And for instance, in Flans, we have a small uh, dongle we developed to connect to the interface for the real data. And at that moment, the coffee box can have real data, uh, real time or nearly real time data to uh, intraday maybe optimize further. Yeah, but thanks. So maybe a, a sub question was, uh, do it, if you use the, the data from the smart meter, do you need to get approval from the grid operator? Sorry, can you uh, repeat? Sorry, if, if you're using the data from the smart meter, do you need uh, to get approval from the grid operator to, to be able to use that, that data? Yeah, of course. Uh, GDPR-wise, you cannot do anything without consent. Eh? For, for us, uh, as we are community-driven, uh, we see what's happening with personal data around the world. We always start from the consent of the user. So even for the coffee box to use data, we start from the consent of the user. So whether we get it from the local uh, interface, whether we get it from the DSO, uh, for instance, again, yeah, I know the Flemish uh, side the best. Uh, we have now a, an API directly on the backend of the DSO. It always goes through an OAuth consent flow. And this is the way we can get officially data. Maybe from the supplier side, the same. If we get data from the supplier, it will be a consent from the user that we can have the data uh, from the supplier. Always GDPR uh, as a first step. Thanks a lot, Vincent. Yes, uh, data protection is also in our project, of course, very, very uh, important. Um, we need to move on to the next speaker, uh, Malte, who will share uh, yeah, some insights into possible services that we can offer with this, uh, this VPP ecosystem. Malte, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Vincent, for the presentation of the project. Now I want to introduce the, the business model which we want to, uh, yeah, to, to make possible uh, with the rest of VPP services. So I start with the first service, um, which is like the basis for, for all the other services. So um, part of the project is to further develop an energy monitoring app. There's already existing apps which we, which we are based on. So the um, app has been developed by Energy ID, so from Vincent's company. And um, the, the idea is to, to gather the data to, to present and make comparable the what and when of consumption. So Presenting means, of course, first you have to gather data. So from smart meters, from PV inverters, from uh, many different integrations, as Vincent was showing, and can also be extended with weather measurements, forecasts, pricing information, and so on. And 
then uh, the what can be metrics. So total consumption, CO2 intensity, self consumption rate ratio, and so on. And then the when is very important. So uh, to see whether the consumption happens, for example, at times with high solar irradiation or low prices. So to know what opportunities are there. So for the cooperative, there's the revenue. So um, to, to offer such an integrated tool, so you can, you can increase the, um, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the service to your members and the members then they gain actionable insights. They can make use of, of the data to, to reduce consumption, to increase uh, efficiency or to, to shift demand. And next slide. Um, the, the next step in the service is, is to, to link those individual data with the cooperative. So to share insights. Um, the idea is to perform energy performance services. So for the cooperative, the cooperative can manage the distributed members and assets so they, that they have an aggregated view. So for example, um, when it's about aggregating production, um, it is to, to see the whole production of all members um, and then to be able to, uh, yeah, to, to give this to the market and to optimize the portfolio or also when it's about to, to, to perform um, demand response or also to see an aggregated view what opportunities are there. And for the, for the members of the cooperative, the, the potential revenue is that they can receive tailored support by the, by the cooperative, for example, energy performance contracting, so that uh, based on the, on the insights they gain um, both individual as, uh, as the cooperative, that they can, for example, replace devices by more efficient devices. And for example, the cooperative could, uh, could um, invest in those devices and uh, contract it to the, to the member so that they can both share the profit from the more uh, efficient devices. Then the next step is to, to actually shift loads. And so we have three more services about shifting, shifting loads. The first uh, service is uh, to, to enable local flexibility by shifting loads. So to increase direct use and storage of local PV production. So the aim is to increase the self-consumption and also the self-sufficiency. The, therefore the, the cooperative will offer the, the coffee box. Here in the, in the picture, you can see um, a PV inverter and a battery. The batteries on the right and the bottom. And uh, on the left next to it, you see a thermal buffer tank of a heat pump. So um, the battery and the thermal buffer tank, they can, they can be used to, to shift loads dependent on yeah, the, the local PV production and the local consumption. And uh, to, to increase self-consumption and self-sufficiency, the, 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 the revenue for the member is then to, to decrease grid, grid interaction and therefore to potentially decrease the bill. So if the, um, if the production costs for, for photovoltaics are lower than the grid costs, then you have an incentive to, to use as much as possible the local PV production. So this is just on an individual level. Now we take it on the, the next level, which is the, the community level. So you can shift loads to, to increase the, re, the use of renewables and to decrease portfolio imbalances. One way is to, to, use, to make use of dynamic time of use tariffs. So uh, in the graph, you see just the visualization. Um, in green, you can see the, the distributed energy um, flow and uh, um, in, in red, the, the, the price curves. So when there is um, 
high distributed energy, the prices are usually low. And when there is few distributed energy, the prices are higher. That way, the, the use of renewables can be, can be increased. Um, for the cooperative, this, uh, this will, can be a revenue by using lower wholesale prices or also uh, lower grid fees. So if the grid fees are becoming uh, dynamic, um, this, this, can be, this can be a business case for the cooperative and also the, the end user, if they receive this dynamic time of use tariffs, they have an incentive to shift loads and can uh, decrease their retail prices. The, the next service um, for uh, regarding shifting loads is to sell aggregated flexibility either to the DSO or the TSO uh, for, for very different uh, purposes. So for example, to, um, to prevent congestion, congestions and to, to manage congestions or yeah, to, to, for ancillary services. So on the TSO level, this is mostly regarding the frequency. On the local level, this is rather for, uh, for voltage control. Um, or to also increase the self-sufficiency in the local network or um, yeah, that's like if there's local flexibility markets as Roland was also already showing and uh, yeah, the revenue stream would be uh, compensation from the DSO or TSO um, for, for, the, for the control and the the end user would also benefit then from the compensation from the cooperative so that they can share the compensation. And um, yeah, so that's the idea for uh, grid support services. So which is um, explicit demand response. And yeah, in the last slide, I want to show you an outlook. So the, the aim of our project is that um, after the project end, we, 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 we are able to provide those innovative technology as a service um, by an European service company so that the project will not uh, just end, and, um, but that the, uh, the technology will be further, further used uh, in, a, in a cooperative, uh, collaborative way. So, um, we, we are building this technology on an open source basis. And so this potential European service company put, could uh, provide the services to, to local RESCOPs. So um, this would be a shared investment and the services can be, can be offered by co-ops for co-ops. And so this would be both a potential for this European cooperative and for the local or national cooperatives to also benefit from the common research and development. So this is, this is our vision that in the end we have, we have uh, such a, an interesting technology to, to build a European company on this. And that's, that's our outlook. Um, yeah. Uh, last slide is, um, of course, you can keep in touch with our project. So we have a web page, uh, we have a Twitter channel, and on our web page you can also um, yeah, um, receive the newsletter. So uh, very soon there will be the first new newsletter, so make sure to sus subscribe for it. We would be happy to, to keep in touch with you and yeah. Now I'm interested in, in your questions. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Malta, for your, your interesting uh, presentation. And indeed, you can follow already. Uh, we're doing some live tweeting as we speak, so you can follow us, uh, the conversation as well on Twitter. Um, I'm checking the Q&A. Um, maybe one question already for you, Malta. Um, from Christian, and I see there's a lot of interesting questions we will take, hopefully take later on, or maybe our panelists can already try to answer them in the meantime. From Christian, uh, how long until market readiness? When are we, with these services, when are we market ready? Um, yes, so 
for for some some services uh, they are already market ready so for example the 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 app so the first service which I was shown is already on the market provided by energy it um, then some other tools are also already being used so for example the forecasts um, by Enercorp, they use it already for the for the load um, forecast uh, and um, Carbon Co-op from UK is also already participating in uh, local flexibility markets, which are already available in the UK. Um, but most other services uh, are still in development. So the dynamic terror, for example, will be uh, tested by some Energia in Spain, but um, yeah, will be will be tested in the course of the next year. I guess w w they will start with it and. Um, yeah, to increase local self-consumption, this is also already something to, which is uh, possible. Now the next step we would be for collective self-consumption to also increase it. So um, that individual, so several members of a, of a, of a project are able to, to participate uh, and to to change their behavior to to increase the the, the common self consumption, so so that is, I guess in total we are we already have quite some project where we are building upon, and the 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 aim of the project is to 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 round it up and to 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 put it into a whole package of tools, and to to bring it to the next level. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for, for your answer, Malta. And I see many more interesting questions. So please have a look at our Q&A as well, Malta. Uh, maybe can, you can already answer some of those. Um, but now we need to move uh, in our program. So I'm really uh, happy uh, to invite um, yeah, two people from Grid Singularity at and Fatima. And they will both uh, it will share uh, some insights about uh, yeah, the solution they are offering a startup and then Fatima will show a real uh, live demonstration. So Ed, uh, yeah, you can start your presentation. All right, cool, thanks, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see and your, your presentation. Yeah. Cool, thanks. Um, so thanks for having me and uh, inviting this to this corporation uh, with Rescope. Um, so everything we will present today, we are gonna share as well. Um, um, in form of a PDF, and there is a lot of links. Um, I briefly start with an introduction of who we are. Um, we are a decent company with uh, 33 people, and I'd also like to take this chance of um, this presentation as a, as a hiring pitch. Um, so we're going to double our team um, this year, and um, we are a very mixed team of economists, uh, software developers, and um, um, Researchers um, were established uh, in 2016 with, with offices in Berlin, Vienna, and Singapore. And what we do is we bring Web3 into energy. What does this mean? Is Web3, in shortest term, can be described as um, um, more truth, less trust. That is the whole kind of mantra behind the movement around blockchains and, um, and this new kind of technologies. And um, so what is driving us is um, many of us in our team, they have been working in corporates in the energy sector and uh, we know the culture. Uh, we have seen um, how this market works and this is what we want to change. We want to, we want to bring a new culture into the energy market that is, um, that is driven by the Web3 mantra. Less trust. We don't want you to trust us. That's why everything we do is open source. Um, you can actually see how we work in real time and um, you can you can contribute and um, you can take it and use it. So what have we do, been doing in the last um, five years? <clears throat> you know, we, we, came, we, we came from a pretty big vision that we are still pushing is um, we need to change, we need to open up the market, we need to bring a new culture in there. And so the first thing that we um, deemed as most necessary is we have to bring the market together and create the smallest common denominator around the globe because energy is the same everywhere there's just a bit of a different frequency between europe and us but energy is the same everywhere and so the first thing that we did um, in the first three years we were building up 
um, a consortium um, uh, known as the Energy Web Foundation. It's by now one of the largest energy consortium um, out there, energy blockchain consortium. Um, the Energy Web Foundation has launched a chain which is operated by its um, affiliates, of which there is uh, more than 170, and it's growing very fast. And um, so the Energy Web Foundation is not operating the chain. It's operated by the, those affiliates from Australia to South America and North America. And um, so this chain can be seen as a decentralized operating system. There is no need to trust anyone. And, um, and it's completely open. So, and, and that should be the base layer uh, for the future that we want to push. What we also did and what we also do is we convene. Um, we initiated um, Event Horizon. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a summit. Uh, we did this a few years. We did a little break now during the COVID and hope to uh, reconvene again uh, next year. And what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides is about what we do at Grid Singularity. So while we were building um, um, the Energy Web Foundation, we had a small team of researchers um, um, analyzing how could we uh, advance the energy market design so that anyone can participate in markets. The smallest asset can participate in markets with at least the same degrees of freedom as any sophisticated energy trader. And um, we came up with this market design. We, we, we tested it in multiple fields. And at the end, you know, we didn't really invent something new. We took the current market design where on the one side you have uh, grid, uh, grid markets, grid related markets like balancing markets, uh, frequency markets and flex markets. And on the other side, you, you, you have wholesale markets um, and uh, there is innovation going on peer-to-peer -peer markets. So we built, uh, those markets reverse engineered those markets built a fairly modular toolkit um, how those markets uh, how those exchanges can be put into one market and then the only thing we added to this um, was well we build it openly it's it's, it, it's open source so you we can have one market with multiple exchanges which run in parallel to each other each exchange has um, its own requirements who can participate in it or which asset can participate in it depending how fast it, it can react and um, um, the main functionality is that these markets, which have multiple exchanges, can be stacked on top of each other. And this enables us that we can place markets according to grid topography. And that changes the whole game because now the bids and asks that go into the markets can be added with attributes like um, where do you want to buy? Uh, where do you want to trade? Do you want to trade only with your neighbors? Because, um, you know, then you only trade in this market. And each market has an API for the grid operators so that the grid operators can also account for the grid, which uh, much more granularly, meaning it becomes cheaper to trade locally automatically. Um, now, the, you know, in terms of regulation, there is different regulation in every country. But we see a general trend going into this direction that the grid will be accounted much more granular than it is right now. And another thing is you can add an attribute uh, to the trades where I say, I only want to trade with my friends or with my social network. And the social network could be spread over the country. And um, because you know this decision is being made emotionally, is maybe not me necessarily made um, economically. And so meaning there is people which would probably, for example, I would, I would, I would, I would donate or give electricity as a present to my daughter, which lives further away, I would like to be able to do this. As a sophisticated energy trader, I can do this. I can't do this as a, um, as a, as a homeowner. And I'm not even allowed to participate in markets. And that is, that is what we need to change. Um, so, and of course, you can decide where to trade, with who to trade, and, and what to trade. Meaning if you want PV, if you want a wind or any sort of um, um, uh, choice. Now, this is a big difference in the energy market because currently, if you want to trade and you, you, you have to be a, a large company, you need to have a lot of cash um, and a lot of know-how to do this. And, um, and so if you go to the wholesale exchanges, well, there you can't know um, what you trade. Because you, you, you don't know what it is, from where it comes, uh, from who it comes and so forth. And at that time, you know, when this was implemented 20 years ago, that was good enough but it's not good enough that we can operate a market that is running on 100% renewables where everyone has the same uh, choice. 
So, um, you know, market design is one thing. And we are, as Bridges and I in Energy Web Foundation, we are on a journey. And that's why any product that is, that is you know, that, that, is, that, that is being pushed out there under the mantra of the Web3, more truth, less trust, meaning we actually aim to decentralize ourselves. And you can only decentralize yourselves um, as, as software providers if you also invent a way um, along the product how the product can continuously evolve further. And that's why, you know, on our roadmap, the first thing we did is we built a simulation environment where we enable the users, uh, the researchers, communities, aggregators, we enable them to test this market design, to break it. And if they can't break it, they can enhance it. If, if this can't be broken, then this must be the solution. And so we actually incentivize people to break our solution. And so um, my colleague Fatma will later present um, one of these simulations, how a user story for a community can create their own community fairly quickly and get, a, get an idea how this work look like for them. And so, you know, you start usually with a simulation. There's kind of a forecast where you test um, how, how, how would this new world look like for you? Because you will realize once you can participate in markets, any of your assets that can participate in markets and is fully controlled gets a return on investment curve. An electric vehicle starts to make money. Um, your battery can actually start to make a lot of money. So you can, participation in markets is key for actually driving the communization because everything will make more sense economically. And, um, and then of course, what we do right now, after a lot of testing, we're now going into real deployment. We have um, over 15 projects being deployed right now where we have a, a real-time running simulation based on real data, where we work closely together with aggregators and DSOs and um, test those markets. Um, and now the most important, as I said before, is upgradability. So we have built the system in a way that once you have a real-time running market, you're basically building up a data trail of everything that has happened there. Now, you know, this is a state, meaning this you, you have a snapshot, you have a, you have a market running right now, but that's not the end because there is always uh, things to improve. And so we are pushing new features every six to eight weeks. And um, also communities might have the idea, we would like to connect to neighbor communities uh, because there might be a community that has overcapacity. There is another community of multi-party houses. They don't have any capacity at all. If they could trade with each other, there would be a very interesting economic benefit. And um, so to enable this progression, this evolution of the market, uh, upgradability, but also interconnection of other communities. Uh, we built the software in a way that you can take historic data, put it into a simulation, um, uh, do the upgrade, and you can get the rationale if this upgrade or the interconnection to the neighbor would make sense, and then you make the, uh, you make the upgrade. And this way, we, we have created a system that continuously allows the market to evolve into more efficient um, 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 operation. So let me talk a bit about our ecosystem. So as I said before, you know, we try to bring these two worlds together on the one side, the grid markets, on the other side, the open markets. And, um, and that's why you know, our, our ecosystem is comprised of grid operators where through the API of the grid operators, they can change the tariffs, they can do real-time uh, grid, uh, grid fee accounting, they can control their own markets like flex markets, but they majorly are the buyers to, to do congestion management and other auxiliary services. On the other side, we have an API um, for aggregators. And the aggregators are uh, actually our most uh, important here, which because they are translating this new degrees of freedom through the API to the final consumers. They are enabling the consumers and prosumers create communities and participate in markets. And um, all those degrees of freedoms are offered through this API where the aggregators can offer um, uh, the consumers where to buy, what to trade, with who to trade. But that's actually not all. We have also um, um, a, a bunch of friends of which some are watching actually right now. Uh, for example, the company Rebase, um, they help um, our ecosystem to um, optimize and actually um, build trading agents, trading intelligence. Because, you know, when I will be 
participating with my home in those markets in the future. I will not be sitting on a computer and or a laptop and buy and, tra- and buy and sell. It will be done by a trading bot, by, by a trading uh, intelligence, by an algorithm. And that is nothing new. That is not sci-fi because 70% of the fintech of the financial sector is working on, 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 on such technology. And so Rebase and other companies, they, they, they are professionals here on the services to aggregators. So let's go a bit deeper on each different um, uh, group here. And the first and most important group here is the communities. So we have created a new, um, a new tool for communities um, that we are slowly rolling out now um, by invitation. We want to, uh, we don't want to open it too fast now because um, it's it's just freshly released right now. It's a simulation environment which Fatma uh, will present, and this simulation environment enables the community in in a, in a few clicks set up their houses. Um, um, take template load curves or upload their own load curves and see how would the trading uh, affect the balances, meaning uh, would it make sense to put a battery in here um, and so forth. And so, and in this environment, you basically are your own utility. Now, once you have done this, the next step is um, you want to come closer to reality. And this is something that we call the canary network, where after the simulation, which is theoretical, um, it's possible that you know we work with a, uh, with a number of aggregators together. You as a community, you already might have an aggregator. So once you have run a simulation and you want to say this is what I want because um, you know everything starts to make sense commercially, um, um, we are very, we are looking forward to um, to talk to you and um, deploy more real time running exchanges based on real data with uh, with connected assets, and we call it the Canary Network as the canary in the coal mine, because it's still um, uh, a test. Um, it's working on real data. But from there, um, this is where we uh, need to, um, you know, from there we can get closer and closer to reality because demonstrations is the only way how we can convince the policymakers to make, uh, to make this a, a reality where we want to go. And um, so coming to the aggregators, um, we see a, a very strange kind of development in the last few years. There is some form of entry barrier for innovators um, um, on the aggregation side. If you want to build a utility right now, it, it costs you a lot of money. So here in this graph, I'm showing like just the capital expenditure you need to have if you want to create, if you want to be a utility and provide services to final consumers. You need to build an app. You need to implement hardware. There is market communication, CRM, market billing, BRP reporting, all the stuff you have to do, and quite a big block that you need to um, you know, you need to build a system to be able to trade energy and actually do grid tariff accounting. So the goal that we have is, is absorbing the energy market complexity behind the API and reduce all these blocks so that you as an aggregator can focus on the real clients. We, we, are, we are working with a number of aggregators together which build solutions for final consumers, but they're actually trying to sell to the utilities right now, which is a bit of not right to our opinion. And why do they try to do it? Exactly because of this, because the entry barriers to enter, to do innovation are too big. That's why we have to open source it. We have to reduce the barriers so that we can see a Cambrian explosion um, um, that, that finally brings all the degrees of freedom to us as consumers and prosumers. So reducing the cost of serve is one goal that, that we, uh, you know, that we try to achieve for the aggregators. And the other one is this new degrees of freedom that are enabled through this API will actually enable aggregators to scale much faster. Because um, if you enable your clients to invite, you know, to create their own communities um, and unlock social trading, uh, which, which um, of very often are based on emotions, you know, these social networks are the only reason, uh, kind of the biggest reason how something can scale um, um, uh, exponentially. So there is, there, is, there is very good reasons to go into this direction um, for aggregators. And we hope to get more and more aggregators on board so that um, we, can, we can make this a reality. Um, and if we look at grid operators, we have, we, we have been working, are working with a number of grid operators together from around the globe. Um, predominantly DSOs right now, and 
how we work with them together, we do continuous innovation cycles. A lot of DSOs um, have their own internal research, how to account um, better for the grid with algorithms and so forth, or how to operate local markets. And if you think this story further a few years, grid operators that innovate right now, and you know why do they need to innovate? Because they're regulated, they have a secure business. But what's happening around the globe is actually communities more and more tend to have the interest to own the grid themselves. And where is, where is the role of the grid operators right now there? So meaning those grid operators that, um, that innovate right now, they actually at one point in time, you know, it depends on the country and regulation, they will end up building software solutions that enable actually communities to operate their own grids. So the grid operator 2.0 from our perspective, at one point in time will develop grid operator as a service um, uh, to communities. And so we we help grid operators in, in, in testing um, their, their research in kind of um, in, in, in simulated market environments. So this is reducing costs. On the other side, grid operators love open source because uh, we can share. We don't need to re reinvent the wheel. And um, yeah, that's uh, how we work with grid operators. And with this I'm at the end of my presentation and would hand over to Fatma, my colleague, to do a little demo. Fatma, I think you can... Yes, um, th thanks a lot. Um, so, uh, Fatma, if you can share your screen and start a demonstration, it would be great. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, um, Ed, for the presentation. I will share my screen now um you can see it right yes we can see yeah. your screen yeah. yeah yeah okay um thank you very much again um so ed uh, already gave an introduction on our product and our company and uh so um just to summarize grid singularity is trying to uh you know empower everyday user to be able to participate in energy communities by um, having this product that can be used by anyone, whether you're tech savvy or not, uh, so that we can, you know, uh, go into the energy transition from, like somebody mentioned, a uh, hundred year old energy systems that have already been in place that really do not allow the everyday user to participate in. So I, um, I'm showing you for the first time our our new uh, rebranded product. Um, this is a beta version, a closed beta version. And at the end, I will also would like if you could, um, if you're interested, you know, sign up so that you can be uh, one of the beta testers for our product because we are open source and we like to have, you know, um, input from everyone. So as you can see in the map, this is a map view. You can see the dots. These dots represent energy communities from all over the world. Some of them uh, are projects and some of them are simulations. So in the three-step process that Ed presented, the first step, which is simulation using the historical data, the Canary Test Network uh, simulation, which is using almost real-time data that is already implemented in our old platform and we have more or less moving everything over to the new platform. Um, the reason is uh, we're moving and rebranding is we have decided to um, get more input from the users so that we can improve the user experience um, so that everyday user can be able to participate and build uh, their own energy community. So um, just to explain a bit, um, sorry, yeah. Um, we, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the red dots represent mostly um, a community, like I said, and the red one is a community that is producing more that it's consuming, and the green dots are for communities that are uh, pr uh, producing more than they're consuming. So if, for example, um, I have a friend, uh, she lives in Potsdam, uh, you can, anyone can start by clicking here, build your own community. You can explore the map. You can type um, an address. For example, I have a friend that lives in Fort, Fort, 
Yeah. Mm. And uh, what's done? Or can be anywhere, even in Austria. I can pick um, if I have a friend living there and um, the map kind of zooms uh, in to the particular region. And yeah, I'm guessing this was not the best example. Um, apologize a bit. I can just pick uh, Ordensmeisterstraße in Berlin, where I live. And yeah, you can see here, uh, we have uh, a couple of simulated energy communities in the neighborhood. And if I uh, zoom in a bit to here, you can see the homes and I can start by building my simulation. So the first step would be to click and add a home. So we have two modes in which you can uh, create your simulation. The first one is express mode where we have um, already a full library with um, pre-configured homes with energy assets such as PV storage and loads. So we'll click this and just write that nice home. And then I'll save that. And then on the map, you can, it automatically appears. Uh, it's more uh, consuming because of the red dots. And in the next building, I can add another home. Uh, let's say it's a flat sharing student uh, home. Uh, so I can write here student dorm and then save. And you can see uh, we have two, two nodes, two homes that can communicate. And I will have to change. Um, once that happens, you can create your own community. So I will write Berlin five community, for example. And then you can configure the uh, settings for this community. For example, in this particular case, uh, I will pick the seven day simulation. You can pick simulations for two weeks, one month, and soon we are going to add a one year simulation. And you can also, for privacy reasons, uh, decide whether you wanna show your map, uh, you show your community on the map or not. So I take it and then uh, if you go to the advanced settings, you can, uh, Sorry. Yes, you can uh, add some uh, some settings. You can add a description. You can pick a solar profile here. For example, we have the sunny, partially cloudy, Gaussian profile, or you, if you have your own uh, profile, you can upload your own profile. And then the next part is to configure the, the markets. So we have different market types you can use. So in this case, I picked the two-sided payers bid. And then you can also configure the rest uh, parameters of the market. So just as an FYI, we will have a tool tip uh, in the next couple of weeks that would actually explain to the user what each and every parameter means uh, so that they can be able to fully understand what they're simulating. For now, you can go to the Singularity uh, Wiki so that you can read on the various features and parameters for the markets uh, and KPIs that are calculated in the simulation. So I will save here. And once you have done that, you can uh, log in. So the idea uh, for us in this, uh, in this release is that anyone can be able to, you know, have run, run a simulation based on whether they have data or not um, without having to log in. So um, I can also, for example, uh, in this building here, add a community PV. So we have um, different files of, um, yeah, CSV files of already configured, configured um, PV. So since it's Berlin, I will pick uh, PV Berlin, and then I will write this to the uh, community PV in my neighborhood. And when it has a geo tag, when you go to the advanced settings, you can see what it is. So this, since this is one kilowatt hour PV, I can put the panel count to be 10 so that I can configure 10 kilowatts. Um, you can pick the solar profile. Um, 
as the same as before in the community and override what, whatever that's there. And then you can configure the selling, uh, the trading strategy of the PV, for example, the initial selling rate, which is um, you can always change its user input or market maker rate, which is a utility company um, selling rate of electricity. And then the rate decrease here in cent per kilowatt per update. This is also, uh, this uh, defines the trading strategy of the bad, uh, of the PV, sorry. Um, so as I said before, we will have a tooltip that would explain each and every process. And for now you can check the Great Singularity Wiki to actually understand what um, the features mean. I would save here and now we can go to the grid market because the community is connected to um, an external grid for reliability in case it's needed, a reliability of supply for electricity. So we have different modes. One mode is this infinite bus mode, which um, allows the community to actually sell its access to the electricity grid. If, and then we have another mode, which is the infinite power plant. And in this mode, the community can only buy if there is, um, if they need um, more electricity that cannot be provided within the community. And uh, the, the utility company cannot buy. So I will pick the infinite bus. The role is grid connected. And then we have the, the selling rate, which is also can be user input. So we have, for example, in this case, the selling rate is 30 euro cents per kilowatt hour. And then the utility company uh, buys a 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And then once I save that, I can come here and run the simulation. So as I mentioned before, this is just a, a beta version and we are working on adding more features in the next coming uh, weeks and months. For example, we will add a PV tool that will enable, once you click on a home, you're able to just specify the capacity of the PV panel in your home. And then depending on the tilt, you automatically generate the PV profile. This is um, so that you can have more credibility in your uh, simulation results. The other thing we are going to add soon is a CO2 uh, cal calculator. So this will calculate the carbon em emission offset of your community um, to the environment. And uh, I, can, I wanna briefly mention that on this left side, you can see the results and you see as the results simulation, this is at 44% right now. You can see the, the uh, yeah, the results changing as you run the simulation. Going back to the features, we are also, as Ed mentioned, working with uh, trading algorithm companies. So for example, we are working on uh, adding an optimization algorithm that would give recommendations for the community where to add more energy assets like PV or storage so that they can reduce on their energy bills or like the grid fee. Uh, we will also add some economic features like calculation of the return on investment for your particular um, PVs and storages based on an average sell, selling and buying price of energy in your local energy community. So um, at the end of the simulation, you can see here, so for example, in my Berlin 5 community, I had two homes, two loads, two PVs, storages. Here I can briefly see the energy bills, what was bought and sold by each and every energy asset or market, which represents the homes or the community PV. We calculate now uh, self-sufficiency and self-consumption of the, of, the, of the community. This can also be done for the individual homes. And we will be adding uh, more KPIs, like, uh, for example, the KPI on savings, where based on the calculation from the simulation of the community, we can calculate in parallel what uh, the community would have paid if they bought from the utility company. And so we will see, you know, the benefit of a community participating in local energy market that is financial. Um, uh, in conjunction with other uh, 
yeah, benefits like the ecological and uh, social uh, welfare. You can see here, there's a graph on the prices and net energy and grid fee. So this is, uh, like Ed mentioned, a very simple step-by-step -step, a way in which you can create your own community. So um, last year, late 2019, last year, and part of last year, we had a collaboration with Bundnis, Buga and Agi, and we had a simulation for them in an energy con community in Chennai. And uh, for example, I can show you briefly a uh, mock-up of, of the community, and you can see uh, the results here on the left. So this is uh, Schönau in Schwarzwald in South Germany, and you, there were 25 homes, 24 loads, and PV, you can see the summary for all the energy assets in the community. You can look at the bills, some KPIs like the self-sufficiency and self-consumption of this uh, community in Southern Germany, and the evolution of the prices for, for, the, for the community. So this is one of the projects that we did. Um, like Ed mentioned uh, earlier, we, are, we have a lot of projects all over the world that are actually running on our Canary Test Network, which means that um, in the second step, in the three-step the three step process, the second step uh, is actually complete. We have projects running on almost real time and uh, the, these companies, energy communities and aggregators are running um, different scenarios and doing analysis to more or less find which is the best configuration for their community in optimizing the social welfare of the community and making sure that their average bills and uh, grid fee are reduced. So, um, like I mentioned in, um, yeah, to more or less wrap up my part of the presentation, uh, what I just showed you is um, the closed beta version that has been um, shown to you in public for the first time today. So if you would like to participate in uh, doing your parts, you can uh, write to us on our, our public Slack GSY communities and also contact, uh, you can write an email to us at contact at gridsingularity.com so that you can uh, say whether you would like to uh, participate in the soft launch, which will be happening in the next couple of weeks uh, before the product is released to the public. And also, um, uh, if you are an aggregator or energy community and you would like to use our free tool, we will take uh, you through uh, the whole process uh, for the, to optimize your community, please write to us uh, using the same addresses. So thank you, anyone. Everyone, uh, does anyone have a clarification question? Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Fatima. It was very interesting, and, and I know we went over time, but it was super impressive to see you demonstrating the tool. Uh, really interesting. Uh, and maybe there were also some questions that you clarified about where uh, can I find more information? When is this tool uh, available? Uh, how can I join the Slack community? As Fatuma said, it was on the slide, but also uh, we will make the recording of this webinar and the presentations available on our website. So uh, for people that missed it, uh, it will be the information will be made publicly available. Um, I saw uh, there were <laughs> plenty of questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, and many of them uh, were already answered. Um, maybe there's, there is one open and was a question that was also raised by, by another participant. Uh, maybe, first of all, the, the panelists, can they switch on their camera so we can uh, see you all in the screen? Um, thanks. Um, there were some questions about uh, blockchain. I know it's a it's a very uh, broad uh, topic, but is some uh, somebody of you can maybe share uh, yeah some ideas of, of of how yeah how does blockchain come into all this story? What what will be the role of blockchain? Yes. Somebody that wants to yeah. yes. So um, so th this is where we started off because you know the, the the you know the mantra behind this is less trust more truth. And um, so imagine, you know, we are convinced at the same time that we cannot push such a market design on, 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 on a country level. 
because we would be, you know, an incredible critical company as Grid Singularity doing that. Not even Google would be do, able to do that. So the only point, the only way to avoid trusting one single company is putting uh, exchanges on something that is trustless. And, um, and you know, I, I, I read a few questions here, yeah, but you kind of correct them. That is not true. You know, it, authenticity doesn't mean that it is not correctable because authenticity just means, you know, and is you track everything. Also what you correct, uh, you're tracing that. So the, the blockchain here will play a crucial part to create consensus between all of, uh, all of us. What do we, um, you know, do arbitration on? Do we do arbitration on, 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 on a database that is owned by a single company or on something where uh, a clearing and settlement uh, was, uh, was authentic, uh, uh, authenticated? That is the most crucial point here. At the same time, you know, uh, applying the blockchain here, um, we reduce transaction costs by approximately 90%. Um, transaction costs through normal payment systems or direct payment, real-time payment. Now we can build a system in where the, the, the tariffs and the bids and asks, they propagate at the same time, meaning the DSOs and grid operators and TSOs, they can do real-time accounting of the, um, of, of, of the grid. So blockchain itself enables just a, a much more real-time interaction. And that is, that is what we need to do. We need to bring the virtual reality over the physical reality so that we can operate at one point in time on 100% renewable uh, market. Thanks a lot, uh, Ed. Um, maybe then also, yeah, a question for for uh, Roland or somebody else. There were also some questions indeed about the role of the of the DSO and what role uh, they play, um, yeah, in in this new landscape. Roland, do you wanna uh, share some insights? Yeah, I can. This is a question that keeps on coming back. Uh, DSOs are at the same time a bit uh, very conservative actors, and for good reasons, they are keeping the the local grid um, functional and uh, and maintaining an infrastructure that is uh, now close to a hundred years uh, on. And at the same time, we're asking them to be one of the key actors of this energy uh, revolution that is taking place, uh, where the need to improve uh, their their management uh, monitoring uh, system with a lot more local controls to manage these bi-directional flows and this new um, installation uh, that they are taking place uh, here and there and uh, they are also asked to be facilitators of this uh, of this uh, of these broad changes um, in most countries they are the data uh, managers they are the ones that are handling the the smart uh, or the meters data and this is the key uh, the, the key uh, raw uh, material of all these services it's data and they have a key uh, role in giving access to, to this. In some countries, it's outsourced to other players in Netherlands or uh, maybe the case in Germany as well. But uh, in, in main, most countries, there are also uh, these key gatekeepers. So they have a lot of work to do. And uh, it's a big, a big regulatory topic also in Brussels. And uh, the DSO entity uh, was, uh, is meant to be set up uh, now or within the course of the year. Uh, this is something that was formulated in the clean energy package. And it is normally there to, to help writing some new network codes that will address these topics. But this is a, a recurring uh, regulatory chapter and uh, we'll see uh, how it goes in the next, uh, the next month. Thanks a lot, Rona. I Look at the time and it's already, huh, it's, it went fast, it's already half past uh, 11. Uh, maybe uh, Fatuma, Ed, do you want to say some last, uh, like a key message uh, for our participants in this webinar? Yeah, um, so, I mean, you know, we started with this, uh, with this journey um, because we want to live in a world like this. And um, and then the more we learned about communities, the more we realized, you know, that that's actually what we can also enable. You know, we have our own uh, communities, um, social and local. And so, um, you know, we would like to invite all the communities to join us on the journey. Um, we are now accelerating as, um, and we believe in the next two, three years, uh, we will see this coming up. So we are not far away from this. You know, some people call us dreamers. Um, um, but, uh, you know, we call us change agents.
Thanks a lot. And and from the from the community side, uh, looking at Vincent, uh, Roland, or Malta, some final takeaway message. Yeah, I think uh, the future of the grid. Well, it's really interesting point because the grids, of course, um, is always uh, you have the individual, uh, the end user now starting to be more flexible and and having more freedom in its hands. But at the same time, a grid is something that is of all of us. Eh? And, and in Belgium, for instance, it's a public company, of course, the DSO, but grid should be in the hands of the end user for the future. But on the same time, you don't want just some people starting all over the, on their own, again, with something. You need something that is holistic for the whole society as a, and this will be interesting to see how this evolves between people front runners with uh, new technology and at the same time, everybody trying to, to bring everybody on board of this um, new, and that, I think this is where the communities come in because they try from their social view always to incorporate everyone in the change and the change will be from the end user, um, but at the same time, in the in the whole world uh, in a, in a system that is connected i mean in the mm -hmm. with everybody we need but the citizens on board and able to succeed the energy transition that that's really a nice uh, wrap up um thanks a lot to everyone for joining our webinar uh, as i said in the introduction this is uh, just ali it's, it's part of a series of webinars um, so uh, keep tuned <laughs> for more um, and you can keep in touch with us through our website. Uh, if you still have questions that were not answered in this webinar, we, uh, yeah, we really like to receive them uh, through mail. Um, so you can uh, reach out to both organizations, Rescue PPP project, uh, contact details will be provided, it can be found on the website. And as I said, this webinar will be made available on that platform too. And of course, you can directly reach out uh, to Ed or Fatuma from Grid Singularity uh, yeah, through the contact details they provided. So thanks a lot uh, for this uh, nice uh, webinar, all of the panelists, a special thanks to you. And uh, yeah, hope to see you in the future. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye.